Part 1 When Mark and Jane arrived in Edinburgh, they discovered that Mark had left his camera on the train. At the lost and found office, he has to fill in a lost property form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I think I left my camera on the train from London early today. Did you, sir? Oh, well. In that case, we'd better fill in a lost property form. Can you tell me your name? Yeah, it's Mark Adams. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, your address? You mean in Britain or in the States? Uh, how long are you staying? Oh, I've still got a few months in Britain. Okay, then. Can you give me your address here? Right. It's 21 uh -huh. Thames Drive, uh -huh. Lee-on-Sea. That's L-E-I-G-H-on-Sea, Essex. Uh -huh. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you want the phone number? Uh, yes, I'd better have that. OK, uh, 0702 35211. Thanks. And you say it was a camera. What make and model? It's a Rico. Rico. How do you spell that? R-I-C-O-H. Uh, OK, got that. Now, you say it was the London train. What time did it arrive in Edinburgh? At 4.55 this afternoon. Exactly on time. Ah, uh, well, then, if we find it, sir, shall we phone you? No, I think I'll drop in the day after tomorrow to check up. Ah, uh, right you are, sir. We'll do our best. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear someone talking to a group of university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers' Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the Secretary of the Students' Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. 
Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here. But once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you. Throughout the week from Monday to Friday, every morning starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at 5 o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum, as well as the popular Ghost Walk. You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. Also in this building is the Trade Fair on Wednesday, from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed. So come along to Blackmoor Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment. That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7.30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers' opening ceremony, when the Dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, Thursday the 18th from 2.30 to 3.30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. 
At the end of the week on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair, so we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from nine in the evening to three o'clock in the morning. Right. I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week, so remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning. As part of our lecture series on everyday health issues, today's talk is on tiredness. We shall look at the main issues in turn, as well as some of the main research that has been carried out in this field. Firstly, it is clear that tiredness is on the rise. No official data exists on the rate of people reporting to doctors with recurring tiredness, but it's a very common complaint. Research suggests that people are not relaxing properly and often work when they do not have enough energy. Furthermore, products to boost energy are also on the rise. Sales of so-called energy drinks loaded with caffeine and sugar have grown by 23% over the last year. And this is not the only instance of an increase in products claiming to boost energy. Guarana, a herbal stimulant, can now be found in everything from chocolate bars to tea bags. Now let's examine what it is that's making people so tired. Dr Liebhold, a Sydney GP, has done extensive research into this and he believes that financial pressures, not taking holidays and not having time off when you become ill due to fear of losing your job are all common causes. Some of the other suggested causes are low oxygen levels in offices, poor diet or illness. The problem is that tiredness is a symptom of just about every kind of illness, which makes tracking down the cause all the more difficult. The next question to ask is, are people getting enough sleep? Dr Mansfield from Melbourne's Epworth Sleep Centre, who specialises in sleep disorders, says insomnia often arises when people are going through a stressful period. Mansfield often needs to re-educate people in how to get off to sleep. He recommends keeping your body clock regular by going to bed and rising at similar times every day and not drinking too much caffeine. And there is some truth in the old story about having a glass of hot milk before bed. Milk contains the amino acid tryptophan, which has been shown to help induce sleepiness. Turning to the question of why we need sleep, researchers are still trying to answer this fundamental question. Sleep deprivation experiments have shown that after 14 days without sleep, rats will lie down and die. 
and after only three days' sleep loss, humans get confused, forgetful, and start having hallucinations. So whatever sleep does, it is important. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. However, not all researchers feel the same way. Trent Watson of the Dietitians Association is not convinced by McMahon's theory, explaining that our bodies don't really like to burn protein as a fuel, so it doesn't really contribute to energy levels. Carbohydrates, however, found in fruit, breads and pastas, are a more common fuel. Anyone following a rigidly high-protein diet with low carbohydrates, even if they are operating at low intensity during the day, could subject themselves to fatigue because they just don't have the carbohydrate stores, Watson says. In general, a good way to stay energised from a dietary point of view is to eat red meat, green leafy vegetables and whole grains. These foods give red blood cells the building blocks for optimum performance in their role of delivering oxygen to muscles. To sum up, tiredness is a health problem on the increase and there continues to be much debate surrounding its causes and remedies. Now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk given by Jim Allen. He is going to share some of his findings of his research. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we'll be hailing from Jim Allen, who will be sharing some of the findings of his research project from last term. Jim. Thanks. Well, to start with, a little bit of background about the project. As you can see, our title is something that is relevant to everybody in this part of the world. Water safety. These days, there's a lot more to water safety because of the increasing number and range of boats and other things people use on public waterways. I'd become interested, through reports on radio, about the number of incidents involving small power boats and individual watercraft, such as jet skis. It seemed to me that because these craft were essentially recreational and didn't require licenses to use, there was very little opportunity to influence the users towards being safety conscious. So, I decided to make this the focus of the project. For the research, we mainly relied upon talking to people, asking them questions in preference to using a written questionnaire. We interviewed a wide range of people at a number of popular swimming locations over two consecutive weekends and asked them what they'd observed or experienced themselves. The respondents were both male and female, but the men were just slightly in the majority. We were pleased with their willingness to talk about the subject and, all told, interviewed 145 people over the two weekends. 
So, what were the findings? As you can see, 86% of people reported having had some type of problem. A surprisingly large percentage, 27%, commented that they had found it necessary to shout at an offending powerboat. But the main type of problem was the deafening sound that some of the boats made. On occasions, this led to swimmers deciding to move to another location. So what strategies did people adopt to ensure their own comfort and safety? Let's have a look at the figures. First, it was noticeable that there were often distinctly different answers between men and women. It was mainly the women, for example, who said they should try to choose places where boats couldn't go. 